Good evening and welcome to the February 13th, 2017 meeting of the Auburn Board of Selectmen. First, I would like to announce that this meeting is being recorded and ask if there's anyone in the audience who is also recording this meeting. We have a representative from the Worcester Telegram who is making an audio recording. Seeing no one else, if you could rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The first item on our agenda tonight is to fill a vacancy on the Auburn Public Library Board of Trustees. That vacancy will be filled in accordance with Mass General Laws. Mass General Laws dictates that the appointment will be made at a joint meeting with the Auburn Board of Selectmen and the Library Trustees. So I will ask Chairman Toth to call his meeting to order. Uh, we do call our meeting to order the Board of Trustees, the Auburn Public Library. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, um, so tonight we will interview three candidates. Um, we will take them alphabetically as um, they have applied. And um, according to the Auburn Board of Selectmen's policy, they have been provided three questions um, in advance, and we will ask those questions to each one of them publicly. I will turn the microphone over to the chairman of the um, Library Board of Trustees. He will conduct their questioning. It will come back to this chairman. At that time, I will open the floor up for motions, um, for nominations to fill the vacancy. Once all motions have been made, I'll close nominations, and we will, by roll call vote, um, appoint a member to the Auburn Library, uh, Public Library Board of Trustees. Um, with that, our first candidate is Ellen Ganley. If you could please come up and join us. First, although I've said, could you just give your name for the record? Sure. Ellen Kinley. Okay. So I am going to ask you the three questions that were given to you in advance. The first question is, what is your interest in serving? Um, I first became aware of the vacancy when I saw a, a social media post from the town. Um, I'm an avid user, patron of the library. I visit it every two or three weeks when my books are due. Um, have visited it with my children who are now both in high school um, and just find it to be a very valuable resource in the community and saw it as a good opportunity to get a little bit more involved in the community and, and give back to something that I see as really important. Do you have any special experiences or skills that will enhance your appointment? Um, I presently work as the Director of Development for the Worcester Community Action Council, which is the region's um, federally designated anti-poverty agency. Um, my responsibilities there include a lot of fundraising as well as public relations. Um, prior to working there, I just completed my second year anniversary, I worked for the City of Worcester for almost 16 years and was involved in a lot of um, government advocacy work, um, very fam familiar with how state government works. Um, in terms of advocating for state and federal funds, um, just kind of how budgets work, that type of thing. I have a lot of experience with special events, um, public relations, that kind of thing. So really anything I could do to help kind of spread the word about the good things that are happening at the, at the building and, and new ideas um, to help it flourish even more. Great, thank you. And the third and final question is, do you have any time constraints that would affect your attendance at the scheduled meetings and or any additional meetings as needed? No, I'm very comfortable that I'd be able to fulfill the time. Okay, and um, I, sh I should have mentioned this prior to the start of the interviews. We have been supplied with um, the resumes of all the applicants and the, um, the application form. Uh, Ms. Scanley does not currently serve on any boards, but you are an elected town meeting member, correct? And if there's anything um, that the three members want to mention about their resume, please feel free to do so if it's not where it's not included in those three questions. But I just want, for the record, that um, we do have the application here in front of us. Thank you. Chairman Toth. Thank you. But before I start, I just want to recognize that our director is here, Jean Collins, and the members of the board are Nan Johnson, Paul uh, Melican, Suzette Dowd, and Bobby Baker. Uh, we thank all the applicants for their willingness to participate in this process. 
The elected or appointed members of the Auburn Public Library Board of Trustees represent the community. It's our responsibility to communicate their interests and assure that they are heard. Our primary role is in developing uh, pro uh, policies for our library. We are not involved in the staffing or the operations uh, or any of those decisions except through the policies that we've approved. We're fortunate to have a strong support from the town manager, town departments, and boards, which makes the work of the library and the trustees more effective and efficient. So I just wanted to at least start out with that with everyone. Uh, Bobby, would you want to start with all the questions? Sure. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, what changes, um, either positive or negative, have you seen in the library over the last five years? I think the physical changes to the building have been wonderful. It just seems more open, um, bright, if that's possible, while still protecting um, the books. Um, every time I visit, I'm pleasantly surprised to see how busy it is. I, I do think it's a, it's a well-used um, institution in the community. As I said, I'm a, a frequent patron and have been um, for all of the 18 years that I've lived in town from when my children were little coming for story times. And, and I'm always really impressed with the variety of programming and it's a very mixed bag. You see your very young families, you see older citizens participating. And again, I just think it's a really valuable asset to the community and would be pleased to be part of a group that would continue to advocate and, and help it continue to, to flourish. I, I haven't noticed any negatives associated with it. Thank you. Hi, Ellen. I'm Nan Johnson. How do you most use the library? You said every couple of weeks you return books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would say when my children were a little bit younger, we probably patronized it in a little bit different way when they were using it for research or summer reading. Certainly it's a popular time. Um, I'm an avid reader, so I'm visiting it really to, to secure reading for fun for myself. Um, when they were younger, we did participate in some of the programming that they had, whether it be a craft and story time um, type of thing. Most recently, I would say we visited, um, the library did a program with the middle school last year where a group of students wrote novels themselves and then were able to come and read them before a live audience. And then the library staff made those available under a local author section. And I thought that was just a wonderful experience. Um, although my children didn't personally take place, they had friends that did and it was just a really uplifting and you could see um, how proud they were of their work and I thought it was a really neat connection to be made Absolutely. between the library and the public schools. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts about the role of technology in the library? That's a tricky one. I'm definitely a, a book reader. I prefer to turn the pages and hold it in my hand, whether it be in bed or taking it to the beach even. Um, I think maybe because I spend so much time on a computer for work. That being said, I do think it's important that the library have resources available for those who maybe don't have internet or don't have quality internet at home. Um, students needing to do some research, it's definitely um, far more technolo technological world than it was even five years ago. Um, I personally am still a fan of the books, but I do think um, I know having like the iPads available for loan, that type of thing I think is a, is a step in the right direction and maybe helps level the playing field for those who maybe aren't able to have those resources in their own homes. Thank you. Hi, Ellen. Paula Mellican. Um, what do you think the future of libraries will be? I hope it would maintain um, <clears throat> a lot of what it is right now and I think that's part of my reasoning for wanting to become involved with it because I do think it's a valuable asset to have. Um, you have seen com communities nearby us who perhaps haven't paid as much attention to it and then fall on hard times and are forced to close their doors or have very, very limited hours. I, I think the fact that we have such a vibrant building is a source of great pride or should be for folks who live in the community um, and I would hope that we'd be able to maintain um, if not continue to grow that, whether that's through programming that perhaps brings in different cross sections of the community who perhaps haven't visited. Um, I'm not sure what sort of connections we have with the senior center, whether it could be some sort of mobile bar 
growing type of thing. Um, there do seem to be an awful lot of classes and workshops that attract a variety of age groups. Um, you know, whatever we could do to kind of enhance that, I think would be a step in the right direction. But I think it's a wonderful place. I um, value it myself personally as a taxpayer and resident of Auburn and, and would hope to be able to maintain, if not enhance that going forward. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder does anyone else have any questions that they'd like to ask? I'll ask the members of the Board of Selectmen, are there any who have any additional questions? I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you so much Thank for you coming for consideration. Thank you. You can have a seat. Next, I'd like to call Carrie Schiebler. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Good evening. If you could just state your name for the record. My name is Carrie Schiebler. Okay. And um, just before I ask the questions, I'll just point out that we do have the resume. And on Ms. Schiebler's um, application, I see that you are an appointed member of the Youth Commission and an appointed member on the Council on Aging, correct? That's correct. correct. Thank you. So with um, moving forward with our policy, I'll ask you the same three questions. Feel free to answer them as how you like. Um, first question is, what is your interest in serving? My interest in serving is that I have been a member of this community for 27 years. I do believe in supporting the community, but above and beyond that, giving back. I am a member of the Youth Commission. I am a member of the Council on Aging. I believe that the library itself is truly a cultural center of the town that it offers unlimited resources for the young to the old with no boundaries in it at all regardless of anything. Thank you. Do you have any special experiences or skills that will enhance your appointment? Um, regarding the two councils that I'm on and the Youth Commission, I am aware of Robert's Rule of Order, um, Code of Ethics, Code of conflict of interest, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and regarding personally, I was a general manager of a hotel for many, many years. So I am very aware of budgets and all facets of financials. I have, I'm also very well spoken as far as dealing with the physical building itself with FF&E and that type of thing, as well as personnel and dealing with diplomacy. Great, thank you. Um, and the last question from the Board of Selectmen, do you have any time constraints that would affect your attendance at the scheduled meetings and or any additional meetings if needed? No. Great, thank you. Jim and Toth? Okay, hi, Carrie. Hi. Uh, let's see, who's gonna start, Bobby? Start? Sorry. Sorry. Um, what uh, changes, um, either positive or negative, have you seen um, in the library over the last five years? I think the biggest change that I've seen with the library is its ability to age with the times, uh, bringing in all of the resources for the internet, the iPads, that type of thing. Um, the building itself looks great. I think that it's keeping up with the times, which is huge. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nan. What do you uh, most use the library for? I have to be honest with you, I haven't used the library for a while. Um, my children were before computer age, so, you know, there was no internet or anything when my children were younger. Um, I had a huge resource with the library for my children for both story time to take them someplace, for resources for um, book reports or whatever. I don't even think they call them that anymore. Um, you know, and, and also to escape from myself with being able to read a book. I'm an avid reader. I read about a book every two or three days. Now I do it with a Kindle. The interesting thing about it is that being a grandmother now, I have started coming back to the library doing story time and that type of thing with my grandchildren. Did you do the toddler dance? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Thanks. 
Hi. Um, what are your thoughts about the role of technology in the library? I think it's inevitable. I think that there really isn't a question of whether or not it's going to be a role, but it has to be a role. And I think it's a good role. Um, you know, the children nowadays don't understand pen and paper as much as they do tablets. They don't understand a book versus a Kindle. And I think that the library, first off, as a resource for true books and that type of thing is necessary. But above and beyond that, it's a good resource for people that unfortunately do not have the money to be able to go online to have, it's a resource for that as well. So I think technology is here to stay. Here, um, what do you see as the future of libraries? That's a good question. Um, my fear is that libraries will someday go away. I don't believe that they will. Um, I think that for my lifetime, they will still be an integral part of the community. I know sitting on the Youth Commission that a lot of the children that we see at um, our Youth and Family Services and stuff uses that library. That's, that's a place where they can go, they can you know, do resource, they can work on that, but it's also a safe place for them to be kids and to be comfortable. I also work with the Council of Aging, so those elderly people that I see there um, rely on the library, and I think that in this town, I hope that the library will continue to be funded and to last a lifetime. Thank you. Thank Are there you. any other questions? Board of Selectmen, have any questions? Thank you so much for coming up. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you. And next we have Jennifer Shea. Good evening. Hello. Your name for the record, please? Jen Shea. Thank you. You prefer Jen? Yes. Okay. So also included in our packet is Jen's um, resume as well as her application. And her application is for the um, Library Board of Trustees. She does not currently serve on any of the boards or commissions, correct? Right. Thank you. So um, as I asked the others, the first question is, what is your interest in serving? Well, as a fairly new member to the town of Auburn, I thought this would be a great way to get myself more involved. I know it's not a long-term time commitment at this moment, so I can really explore what the options are there and get my feet wet in something that I'm passionate about. I value education, I value reading and learning, and I think a library and reading usually is a starting point for a long-term love of education. So this would be a great way to, to start that foray. Great, thank you. Do you have any special experiences or skills that will enhance your appointment? Uh, my background is well-versed in higher education, which I think provides a unique facet into libraries today. To many of the questions you've asked, we're looking a lot at young children, but often the reading can end from high school beyond. So understanding that kind of higher education side and beyond that, how we bring it back um, can be beneficial. I'm also well-versed in a lot of policy and procedure documentation and follow through. So understanding the guidelines and what our goals are in creating that will be helpful for this role. Great, thank you. And do you have any time constraints that would affect your attendance at the scheduled meetings and or additional meetings as needed? Not at this time. Great, thank you. Jim and Thank you. Yep. Um, what changes, either positive or negative, um, have you seen in the library over the last five years? So as a new resident, it's really hard. <laughs> to answer that question um, but as you know being aware of what's going on in town I certainly see that there's always activity there so it seems like there's been a good maintenance of number of visitors coming activities going on versus a decline which can be often seen just because of you know various times and what's happening that that's not the first thing people go to but I certainly see there's always activity there so I think that maintaining that visitorship has been a positive. Thank you. Hi Jennifer. I'm Nan. 
How do you use the library most? I, I must agree with the, the second applicant here. I also currently don't have a need. I don't have young children. I don't have that piece there. But I do know and have been engaged with others who have engaged in the historical records that are kept there and how valuable that can be to research purposes and what's going on. And just knowing that it's there if I ever need it and have resources or friends or colleagues who ask about different things, I know that it's there and I'm aware of what's going on from knitting clubs and different activities to the value of the books in those shelves as well. Thank you. Hi, what are your thoughts about the role of technology in the library? Technology is definitely inevitable, but I think it's a fine line between technology and the hardcover book and how a library works. Um, access to a variety of things is, is growing. It's not as a concern that there are many that don't have those access to internet or other pieces. So balancing technology in a library is important because it's there for the help of research. I'd really love to bring back the Dewey Decimal System personally, but you know, you use the technology and I was finding research to search for it to find those new pieces um, and so we have to kind of adapt to what people use but we can't give up the heart of a library and the hardcover books and those pieces being there at the same time. Hi Jennifer, Paula Mellican. Um, what do you think the future of libraries is going to look like? I think it's historical. It's keeping our records. It's keeping our history alive. It's holding those rare, valuable, unique books and then bringing in those, those facets that bring each community together. So someone mentioned the local authors. Pulling those pieces there versus being the resource which it was before of let's go in, let's get our book, let's read, let's take it home. Many people do go and buy or take them online now. So I think it's kind of becoming a historical nature and we need to appreciate those values and keep them there to, to build that history. Thank you. Very good. Any other questions? Thank you so much Thank for you. coming in and answering our questions. I can, I'm happy to ask that question. Sure. Okay. Um, and, and I can, it's a yes or no question, so I'll relate. Um, the library trustees would like to ask one additional question. And and um, I'll start in the same order. Um, the question is, um, are you intending on running for the permanent seat um, if appointed? Mrs. Gamley? Yes. Mrs. Schiebler? Yes. Mrs. Shea? I have not made a decision. Okay. Thank you. So for the record, for those that, who could not hear, um, Mrs. Gamley said yes, Mrs. Schiebler said yes, and Ms. Ms. Shea said she has not made a decision. So now the next um, process will be to open the floor for um, nominations. This appointment will be made uh, this evening and will be valid from February 13th to May 16th, 2017. Are there any nominations? Um, I nominate um, Ellen Gainley. I have a nomination for Ellen Ganley. Is there a second on that motion? I'll second that. I have a second from Ms. Paula Malikin. Are there any other nominations? There are no further nominations. Let me make a point of order, Madam Chairman. Um, may we put forth all the, the candidates this evening that have uh, put in their resume? The, the floor is open for nomination, so anyone who is nominated will be um, available to be appointed. Uh -huh. After uh, um, nominations are closed, then by roll call vote, if there is more than one nomination, I will announce who has been nominated for appointment, and you will select from that list who your preference is for appointment. I see. Are there any further nominations? I nominate Jennifer. Okay. I'll second. Is that Jennifer Shea? I, I Jennifer just wanted Shea, yes. And I have a second, yeah. Ian Johnson, second. for the record. Are there any other further nominations? Um, I'd like to nominate Carrie Schiebler for. I have a nomination for Carrie Schiebler. Is there a second? Is there a second on that? A second. Mr. Carpenter seconds that motion. So all three candidates have been nominated. Having no more nominations, I'll entertain a motion to close the nominations. So moved. Second. So, all those in favor of closing nominations? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. So before us we have Ms. Ganley, Ms. Schiebler, and Ms. Shea. Mr. Chairman, I will ask you to call for a roll call vote of your board. 
Mike starting in the corner, please, so I can okay, document it. Your vote. In favor of the three or one particular? One particular. One. I would cast my vote for Ellen Ganley. For, for who? Ellen Ganley. Ellen Ellen. Ellen. Yeah. Thank you. I would also cast my vote for Ellen Ganley. Okay. Cast my vote for Jennifer Lee Shea. Um, I cast my vote for um, Ellen Ganley. And I cast my vote for Ellen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll now call the roll of the Board of Selectmen. Mr. Berthium? Uh, I'll not, or, um, vote for Ellen Ganley, please. Mr. Carpenter? I'll vote for Ellen Ganley as well. Ms. Brotherton. Ellen Ganley, please. And the chairman will also vote for Ellen Ganley. With eight votes, Ms. Ellen Ganley has been appointed to the Auburn Board of Library Trustees. Um, and just procedurally, if anyone, any members of the um, library trustees are willing to reconsider the vote so that we can have unanimous support for Ms. Ganley, it's often done after a roll call vote. Thank you. So congratulations to Ms. Ganley. I thank you all for coming in and um, good luck on the ballot in May. Thank Mr. you Chair very much. Mr. Chairman, if you would like to um, adjourn your members. Hope to adjourn. We'd like to adjourn. Okay. Please. Yes. Is there a second on that? Second. Yes. I second. I mean, and the vote. Yes. Yes. Affirmative. <laughs> and it, I'll entertain a motion to take a three minute recess. Almost. Second. All those in favor? Aye. We're in recess for three minutes. meeting of um, Monday, February 13th, Board of Selectmen is back in order. Um, back to our agenda. We have no one signed up for public comment. Um, the next item is a 705, which we are well past. Route 20 Auto Sales, Inc., a motor vehicle class two license application at 518 Washington Street. It is a continued hearing. Is there a motion to reopen the hearing? So moved. Is there a second? Second. The hearing is reopened. In your packet, you will find some documents related to this. At our last hearing, we had some questions for the applicant, but I believe, you know, most significantly since our last hearing, we have been notified by the landlord um, to the license applicants that they have been um, given a 30-day notice to vacate the property that they lease. Um, from the um, landlord to conduct business and um, therefore um, do not have access or permission to use the property um, to conduct sales with a motor vehicle class two license. Do members have any questions or comments regarding that? Mr. Carpenter. Just a process question. If the couple that were looking to do this find a more suitable location, for lack of a better description, in town, is there a way to credit them or can we refund them the at least the license fee? So that's something that the Board of Selectmen would have to take a separate vote on um, if they were to apply. Um, the at, at the time, if they were to apply, it, the board could take a vote to apply a previously um, given fee to that site. Okay. So there's, if I can, there's no refund policy. We can't just refund them the money and let them pursue whatever avenue they may yeah. choose to. Well, it's, 
um, I, I'll let the town manager speak to this, but it's my understanding the, the fees are to process the application and cover expenses that have been incurred by the town, by that department, That's and correct. I would assume those fee, those costs have already been incurred? That's correct. Uh, when fees are established by a municipality, based on Mass General Law, it is to cover the cost of the administration of the provision of said license. So uh, the technically the town has already put the administrative time into this, but the board could certainly take a, a vote to waive that, but in general the, the costs have already been incurred by the time the project gets to you. Thank you. So there is no no one here for this hearing. Um, the board, um, we can take action tonight after we close the hearing. We can either approve or deny the license, but um, it would be my rec recommendation that we deny the license where the license is for that site and not another site. Um, is there a motion to close the hearing? Is there a second, Mr. Berthium? All those in favor of closing the hearing? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Is there a motion regarding the license applicant? Can I ask a question before we do that? Mike? Certainly, Mr. Carpenter. Have we heard from these folks at all in the office? Uh, through the chair, uh, we have. Uh, they, uh, they were not, they notified us that they were not aware of the notification from the property owner and landlord, uh, but we do have a copy of the letter that was sent to them. And the, I believe the property owner was in the office a couple of times and confirmed that this was the uh, action he wanted to take. Thank you. I'll make a motion that we deny the application or deny the license. Second. Any discussion under the motion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The application is denied. The next agenda item is a vote to revoke the motor vehicle class two license under Rockdale Auto Group, 518 Washington Street with conditional approval of Route 20 auto sales. Um, so this is, the license is currently held under the landlord's name, he can continue to do business under mm -hmm. the existing license. It would have nothing to do with the applicants of the previous agenda uh, agenda item. Um, but if Mr. LaRusso chose to um, have, an, have, a, have sales at that business, he does have a license for it. So I don't know if um, members have any comment on that. Mr. Berthium. Um, based on the last meeting that we had, it appeared that uh, things weren't done, being done correctly there. And whether it be, you know, it kind of seemed like it was under him, but somebody was managing the dealership for him under his license. Um, and did we suspend it for 30 days or did we continue it for 30 days? <laughs> We didn't, we, we didn't do either. What we did is um, continue the hearing for the previous applicant, but put the current license holder on notice that he needed to come into immediate compliance with all the terms and conditions of his license because there have been so many issues. So we can ask Mr. Moody if, if he's available. If you could come up to the table, please. Good evening. Can you just give us a status update on the activity at this site and the current license? Yes, I believe it's still under the control of the previous applicant, Route 20 Auto Sales, but they are in compliance as far as the site's concerned, and they were as of the day after the meeting, last hearing. Okay, so they're currently in compliance? They are. All the parking is per okay. the approved plan. Okay. So, so this agenda item, um, Mr. Berthium, was to revoke conditionally um, the Rockdale auto license um, upon approval of the previous agenda item where we did not vote to um, 
approve the license for Route 20 auto sales, um, we wouldn't be, it, it wouldn't fall under these conditions. If we wanted to revoke, have a hearing to revoke the license, we would need to schedule that because the, it was conditional to revoke it conditionally. Mm -hmm. So um, our building inspector has informed us they're, they're in compliance. Um, if you'd like, we can ask him to keep us updated. If they, if they are not in compliance, we can immediately schedule a hearing and have the applicant, the license holder in. Yeah, I would definitely appreciate, um, you know, somebody letting us know if, if they fall out of compliance again, because it just, it didn't seem to me that from last meeting that we had that, you know, they obviously did once it came to the board, but they weren't heeding your warnings. Uh, and I don't want to have any disrespect to any of our heads. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. So, Mr. Moody, if you, I know that you monitor that site closely because of the past issues. If you could please alert the town manager if there are any issues at all with the site, and we will happily put put an agenda item on to um, call a hearing for potential violations. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you so much thank for you. coming in. Thank you. So, um, so there's no action needed to be taken on agenda item 4B. The next item we have is a hearing on petitions by National Grid for pole locations and conduit construction at Carriage Drive. It's a 710 hearing, which we are past that time. Is there a motion to open the hearing? So moved. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Is there a representative here? Yes. Okay. If you could come up, please. Here? Sure. Okay, I'm here from National Grid requesting permission for a petition. Excuse me, could you just give your name for the record, please? My name is Kimberly Tavali Mola. I'm here from National Grid requesting a petition for Carriage Drive to install one solely owned pole beginning at point approximately 50 feet north of the center line of the intersection of South Street. And, excuse me, and also to construct a line of underground electric conduits, including the necessary sustaining and protecting fixtures under and across the public way. Well, what's, what we're basically going to do is replace the existing direct buried cable with conduit, with cable inside of conduit. And they have submersible transformers in the ground. <clears throat> we're going to replace those with uh, pad mount transformers. Uh, there's a big reliability issue, and it's upgrading the condition. Okay. Thank you. Do any members have any questions right now? Mrs. Brotherton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, do we have any abutters here? I'm going to get to that one. Just oh, I'm sorry. No, no, that's okay. Do we have any questions for oh, the National Grid Center? No, I'm Bear sorry. Center? I'm no. sorry. I just didn't. No, no, I'm no. jumping ahead of the gun. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. No, so um, in your packet you have um, notice that was sent to the abutters and a uh, sample notice that was given. There are um, five abutters who are notified of this hearing tonight. Are there any abutters present? Would you like to speak to this matter? If you can just come up for the, to the microphone and give your name and address, please. Hi, my name is Paul Talbot. I'm 221 South Street. And um, I just had a question. If, if we're going to be burying the conduit on the ground, how far away are we going to be coming off the, uh, the road? Because we, we have a tree line that's parallel with the road, and we're just wondering, you know, how it's going to affect the trees. Okay. You know, we, we, we have some privacy, and we just don't, we don't want to lose the trees. Okay. If, if you could come up and sit here, that way you can answer some questions if there are any other questions, um, rather than jumping up and down. So did you, did you hear his question and understand what he's asking? Um, he's asking how, can you say it one more time, please? Well, we're parallel with uh, the, 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 uh, the road, and we're just where we have a tree line. We're afraid if you're going to be digging up all the, uh, all the ground, you're going to be digging up all the roots. So what's going to happen with the trees? Are you going to be planting grass? And 
well, there's, um, there's existing cable there right now. I don't know the exact location of the existing because this is not my particular job. I'm just here for the person that couldn't be here tonight. But I can get back to you with the answer to that. Usually what they do <clears throat> is they put it where the cable is already run, right, right close to the, uh, to the road. And they dig, whatever they have to dig up, they hydro seed. They don't usually take any uh, trees out. But I you can get back many, to you with the answers. You know that. how many feet off the road you're going to be? Let me check this. No, I don't know how many feet off the road. But like I said, I can get back to you on that okay. tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Do you have any other concerns, or is that the only That's concern my with the trees? Main, yeah, my main concern. Okay. Are there any other abutters who have any questions this evening? Yep. Um, so I do have a question um, following up on, on the abutters question. Um, is this a time-sensitive project? When do you plan on beginning the work? I have concerns that we have an abutter here that was um, had a question and we're not able to answer that question tonight. So um, is there a concern if we continue this to our next meeting, which would be in two weeks, so that we can get answers rather than conditionally approving this? Um, I think they were two, two important questions that he asked that, that um, for our own comfort level, we'd like mm -hmm. to have answered before we take a vote. You can continue it, that's fine. Okay. Seeing no other about us, are there any um, questions from the board? Uh, Mr. Berthium? I'm just looking at the map, um, it looks like there's uh, one line that's coming in from the street that says 2.25 uh, feet. Um, so I, I guess that's what I'm wondering is if that's what the abutter is asking. Um, is, is that where the, is the hashed line uh, the proposed uh, area for the, um, uh, it looks like the solid line is the edge of the street and the hashed line might be the proposed area that the uh, line is gonna go in? Uh, once again, I'm going to have to get back to you. Okay. I was just sent here, yeah. you know, okay. at the last minute. Okay. So. And um, Ms. Jacobson, I'll just ask you if, um, if our DPW director slash town engineer has reviewed this. Uh, through the chair, yes, he has. Mr. Coyle, as you said, is the DPW director and that town engineer. He's reviewed it from a perspective of the road and the conduit and had no concerns with it. He did ask that if this does get approved, that National Grid uh, work with him prior to the start of the project. So based on the questions that we have this evening um, from the abutter as well as Mr. Berthium, um, I, is there a motion to continue the hearing? We make a motion. We continue the hearing to February the 27th at 7.10 p.m. Second. Just under discussion, if you could just check with Mr. Talbot, just get his phone number and um, so you have his contact information, as well as ensuring that um, Mr. Coyle is contacted regarding these questions so that they can um, we can have updated information for our next meeting. And I'll just ask once more, no other abutters who have questions regarding this hearing? So the motion is to continue the hearing until the 27th at 7.10 p.m. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed, so voted. Thank you. Thank you. And they'll follow up with you regarding your questions. Thank you for coming in. The next item we have is an auto repair license application, TNM Auto Body and Repair, 848 Southbridge Street. That hearing was advertised for 715, which we are well past the um, hearing time. Is there a motion to open the hearing? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Oh, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Is the applicant here? If you could come up to the microphone, please.
First of all, please give your name for the record. Alberto Torres. Okay, thank you. And could you just tell us a little bit about what your intentions are at this location? Uh, auto body and repair. Auto body? Okay. Mm -hmm. And you've met with the DCG, the Development Coordination Group, to discuss your plan? Are you the one who met with them? Uh, probably. Mr. Moody, Mr. These gentlemen, yes, I'm sorry, yes. Okay. I just, the abbreviations, okay. you know. Okay. And, oh, sorry. and so you've met with them, discussed your application. Yes, ma'am. They've addressed any concerns that they may have, and you've talked about them. Yep. They've also included some suggested conditions that we place on the license. Are you familiar with those conditions? Yes, I am, yes. Okay, I will read them just for the record. Yep. They've recommended if we approve the license that the applicant shall comply with all conditions of approval previously granted by the Planning Board and Zoning Board of Appeals. The applicant shall obtain all necessary approvals from state agencies, most notably from the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Copies of state issuances shall be provided to the Auburn Board of Health prior to receiving an occupancy permit. And the applicant shall obtain all necessary permits and inspections from the Auburn Fire Department, Board of Health, and Building Department prior to receiving any occupancy permit. You're yes, with that? Okay. Yes. Do members have any questions regarding this location or this application? Mr. Carpenter. Just a process question. I know we get comments from the DCG, and it, typically the applicant says that they're aware of it, and then we read it into the record. Is there any way that we can provide prior to the hearing the applicant the written recommendation of DCG rather than? Does DCG um, provide this to the applicant at the time? If, if, why don't you come up and join us at the table? Yeah, that's okay in case there are any follow-up questions. <laughs> Thank Good you, evening, Madam Chairman. Uh, Matthew Benoit, Town Planner. Uh, uh, typically, yes. Uh, it either comes directly from me to the applicant or it'll go through Shannon Regan in the Town Manager's Office to the applicant. Okay. And just procedurally, I think we've we've known that they've had these before. It's just to ensure that they become part of the permanent record. So, and there were there was no concerns or discussions outside of what we've read tonight regarding this application. No, ma'am. Okay. Are there any about us or any public comment on this? Did you have anything else you wanted to add? Uh, no, ma'am. No. Okay. Thank you. Seeing none, is there a motion to close the hearing? Moved. Second. There's been a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Is there a motion regarding the application? Madam Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve the license provided that all applicable requirements of the state and town and any of its departments, boards, and commissions have been fulfilled. Said license is subject to all conditions stated upon it. Failure to comply with any and all conditions shall invalidate the license and render it null and void with the conditions of the G to be placed upon the license. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you so much and good luck with your new venture. Thank you, ma'am. The next item we have is a presentation of an Eagle Scout project by Matt, by Scout Mark DeRocher. And you are here with us. And who is here from the town? Mm -hmm. Mr. Bloomquist. If you both want to come up and join us at the table. Good evening and welcome. Thank you. First of all, if you can just give your name for the record, please. I'm Mark DeRocher, Life Scout from Troop 121. Great, thank you. I'm Wayne Bloomquist, Cemetery Parks and Rec Superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Bloomquist. Welcome, and we look forward to hearing about your proposed pro Eagle Scout project. Thank you, and thank you for your time tonight. So as you know, I'm a Life Scout from Troop 121 in Auburn, and I plan to do my Eagle Scout project here in my hometown. My project includes me building bat boxes, 
for the town. And what the bat boxes will do is they will serve to increase the bat population. And why this is important is because bats play a crucial part in our ecosystem. And right now throughout North America, a disease um, called white nose syndrome, or WNS, is going through and it's demolishing these populations, which is not good for any ecosystem. And so what I'm planning to do is to build the bat boxes to give them a environment to nest in during the spring and then they can um, build up their population over the summer, which will improve the playing fields for Auburn and will lower down the mosquito and insect problems that we have. And it's a natural solution, so also lower down the insecticides that we use to take care of mosquitoes or any pesty insects. Very good. Mr. Blomquist, would you like to? Uh, well, Mark had contacted me at the cemetery um, in the past, and I wanted to bring him, bring him before the selectmen so that we could all, the whole town, could know <coughs> exactly what his project was and bring up some questions, you know, as to who's going to maintain the boxes and mm -hmm. things like that, and um, just make it a public awareness so that everyone is on the same page. I know in the past we've had a few scout projects that were started and left unattended and everybody said who did this, so that's why I wanted to bring it to the public meeting. Mm -hmm. And you support this project? Yes. Great, thank you. And did you bring something to show us? A, a I did. Visual? This is what me. This is what the box will look like. It's a simple design. There's no pieces that are going to fall off over time. And if so, they can be repaired, but I doubt it will happen. The paint won't fall off. It won't chip, so it won't look bad. And um, they are simple to make. I'm going to make 10 boxes to post up in the community if I get approval. And I will be building them with younger scouts in my troop. Great. So this is your proposed Eagle Scout project. Have you gone before the board yet to get approval? I needed approval from the town before I could. Oh, okay. Great. So that's in the near future? Yes. Great. Mr. Berthio. Um, so we're going to do 10 boxes. Yes, sir. Um, how high up do they need to go? Well, the bat boxes need to be 12 to 15 feet tall to keep away from predators. And so what I plan to do is either to mount them on a building wall, or if there's no walls available, I can put them on a 18 foot pole. Okay, and as far as the uh, bats, I, I realize they have a purpose. Um, there's always the th what you hear about rat, uh, rabies and that type of thing, but I understand most bats are not rabid. Uh, what, what is your knowledge of that and what, what it, are potential dangers to, um, so we, we know that there's now um, benefits to the ecosystem, but what about to the human being? What dangers are there by having more bats? Okay. Well, as you know, bats are nocturnal animals, so they don't come out during the day. Where they're going to be placed, and I hope to have help from Mr. Bo uh, Bloomquist in placing them in the um, appropriate locations away from houses and anywhere that could have small children for that potential threat. There, I l researched this for a long time, and I found that there isn't a great threat with bats with any human populations. They're going to be far away from houses, so there shouldn't be a problem with any nesting within houses. And um, as you said, there are a lot of positive effects, and there aren't any negative effects that I could find. So you, you say that they're nocturnal and they're mounted to a building, um, but you get the curious uh, kid that finds it and decides during the day to um, throw a rock up at the box and disrupt it. Does that, like if you do that to a beehive, the bees come out. Mm -hmm. um, if you did that to a, a box uh, with the bats, would, would they then get stirred up and come out during the day? Well, I mean, that situation, I believe that they would, but I don't think that they would go down and hurt the child that threw whatever he was throwing at the box. I think the bats would just leave the area and try to find a better place to be. But to counteract that from happening, I think what we could possibly do is put a sign on the box that says, do not throw any items at or just 
don't touch so that whoever is around that box won't do anything to it but I doubt anybody would want to do that to a box yeah, thank you does anyone have anything else Mr. Carpenter just uh, for Mr. Bloomquist you, you mentioned there were some issues with prior projects is there some sort of contract some sort of what is it that the department's going to do in that they're asking your assistance to keep track of who's responsible well this is this is going to be one of the questions that I was going to ask him at the meeting because I was who is going to be responsible for repair or mm -hmm. maintenance of them so as a Boy Scout I'm a very honest person and I plan to complete this project and do it to the best of my abilities so that we don't have any problems in the future if there should be a problem with the box at any time Mr. Bloomquist or whoever is in charge in the possible future can contact me and I'll fix the box myself. But as I said before, I'm building these boxes to the best of my abilities, using the best products I can. So I doubt that there will be any problems, but if there should be, I'd be willing to take care of them. So. No, it's fine. I'm just, from a perspective of the town, the town is, you know, going to be here. You may move away, you may not mm -hmm. be available. So it's up to the town to make sure that when we're supporting these things that we have a game plan when mm -hmm. the initiator may not be available yeah. to, to come up with what we're going to do if something falls, if there's damage to, mm -hmm. you know, God forbid, you know, there's damage to vehicles, people, mm -hmm. we need to make sure that we're, we're covered. No, of course, and that's why I think we're going to take a lot of time to think about where we're going to locate them. And if anything should happen to the box, say if there's a bad storm or if there's any situation where it might fall or might get damaged, it's easy to replace. And if not replaced, it's not a huge loss. Um, it has a sturdy design, so it shouldn't fall off for any um, small reason. It would probably take a lot of force to put it down, but if it does get taken down, then it would not be hard to repair, and if not repaired, then it's not a huge problem if it has to be thrown away. One more question, if I can. Yes, um, Mr. Carpenter. The bats in our area, what is their typical habitat? Well, there are species, some are cave dwellers, some do mm -hmm. other things. So in our area, what... Well, as I researched, what some bats do to stay warm and what the design is for is while bats are nesting, what they'll do is they'll rip up pieces of bark on trees and they'll make themselves, they'll have a crevice inside the tree where they live to stay warm and usually that faces south or southeast. Other bats do dwell in caves, as we said, and that was the important part, was the WNS or the white nose syndrome happens within caves where there's a lot of moisture. It's the infection that gets to them, and it's passed through bats. So building the bat boxes offers them a place that is dry, warm, and safe away from WNS, and that's why I propose to build them. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, through the chair to the town manager, it, it, somebody from the town obviously is going to have to uh, be out checking these monthly, yearly, um, is that going to pose a problem or un undo work for uh, some of our town uh, workers? Through the chair, I think if the board supports this project, there are still some details that need to be worked out um, with Mr. DeRozier as far as obviously the placement of these and how easily are they accessible for viewing, if not um, maintenance in the future. We want to make sure that, again, they're, they're away from homes, they're away from, from uh, immediate fields and play areas, but we also want to make sure that they're accessible enough so that DPW workers, without having to go out of their way, will be able to keep their eye on them. Um, as far as a liability goes, something like this would fall under our general liability policy uh, because it just becomes part of what the town has. You know, if we have um, other things that are here, Asian longhorn beetle uh, traps and things like that, um, that falls under our general liability policy. So to answer your question, I, I want to make sure that um, if this, if you approve of the concept of having this done, that Mr. Bloomquist would work with Mr. DeRozier um, on where these are 
how accessible are they going to be, and some type of a ongoing maintenance plan for it. Thank you. As with um, with uh, with other things, if if for some reason down the road we're finding that it's too much maintenance, it's not working, we can certainly go back and talk about what the uh, next option would be. First of all, I want to congratulate you on getting this far, you know, in scouting to get to an EGLE project. It's years and years of, um, of hard work, and this is a culmination of that to obtain the uh, highest recognition in EGLE in scouting. So congratulations on that. It's um, You've done a great presentation. Um, I'm, I think you've heard that there's a couple questions that um, the town may have that they want to follow up on, but certainly you've, uh, you've shown us a great presentation. I think one of these days are going to pick your brain though with all the research you've done because I have a lot of mosquitoes and I have a lot of bats but they don't seem to be working well together so I'm going to follow up with you on that but certainly I, I'm comfortable supporting this project knowing that he'll be working with Mr. Bloomquist. We don't have to take action but I think it would be t nice tonight if we could um, make a motion in support of the project and moving forward with the town. I would make a motion that we support the proposal and that we request the town manager report back to us when it is finalized. I'll second that. There's a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Thank you. And Thank you. We'll see you with you tonight. Oh, my father. <laughs> Thank you for, for being here and supporting him through this. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you so much for your time tonight. All right. Thanks. Good luck. Thank you. The next item we have are Board of Selectmen general items. Um, first, we have Coco's Tropical, uh, Tropical Ice out Indoor Entertainment License Application at 1A Swanson Road. Um, is the applicant here? If you want to come up and join us and tell us a little bit about what you're planning and answer some questions the board may have. But first, give your name for the record. Good evening. My name is Donna Raposo. Hi, Donna. So we have your application before us. I understand that you've met with um, DCG. Can you tell us a little bit about what your plan is so that the, the public will also hear? Well, I'm the owner of Coco's Tropical Ice. We are at Swanson Road, one, one Swanson Road, and um, we've been, we're moving into our sixth season this coming year. Yes, spring is coming, and ice cream you will want. <laughs> um, Throughout the years, we've uh, we've always tried to continue to grow and to um, bring in new ideas. Um, and the first year we were in business, they closed the bridge, Swanson Road, so that was a tough season. And then the middle school moved away, so our little middle middle schoolers no longer walk down the road. And then there was the hope of a movie theater last year in our neighborhood, and that has since gone away as well. So I need to think out of the box and. One idea is to potentially one of the gentlemen who works will be working for us this summer is a mu uh, musician, and I thought it would be lovely to potentially have him come maybe once a month or so um, to play his guitar and get a little beachy, you know, atmosphere working, and then potentially that might um, grow for maybe middle school, high school talented individuals, magicians, um, have a an author come and read a story. There's several in town that I'd love to have at my shop, um, moth stories, uh, things along that line. Very small, I have a small little shop, it's geared towards the children, uh, middle schoolers, high schoolers, and to get them involved, maybe a Coco's Got Talent type of thing. Once a month, at, the, at this point, that's all I'm, I'm thinking that it will be, who knows what will happen. Do members have any questions? Mr. Carpenter. I just have a question for the town planner. Um, Mr. Bonite, if you could come up and join us again, please. Thank you. Uh, my biggest concern is parking and availability and where we're, this is a congregate building, so it's a portion per use. Do we have adequate parking? I understand this is being done at night, so perhaps the other businesses are closed, but 
the, the, through the chair, that's correct. We examine the same thing with the applicant, with the other businesses will be closed and the other parking would become available. I believe there's nearly 30 spaces on, on site total. And uh, there's a reserve section to the right side of the building where you can fit 14 to 16 additional cars as well. All right, good enough. Thank you. Are there any other questions? And you did meet with the DCG and are familiar with the conditions they have recommended. I, um, I, I guess I have um, one question for Mr. Benoit as well. Um, their occupancy permit, I assume, states how many they can have inside the building. And one of the conditions states that they need to schedule an inspection with the fire department. That will be made clear at that time. But parking or no, no parking, how many they can have inside the building? Correct. Okay, great. Thank you. So the two conditions are the applicant shall schedule an inspection with the fire department and building department to ensure that entertainment layout is suitable for the building classification. And indoor entertainment hours shall be Monday through Saturday evenings between the hours of 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. Is there any public comment regarding this application? Seeing none, are there any further questions from board members? Is there a motion on this application? Make a motion we approve the license, provided that all applicable requirements of the state and town and any of its departments, boards, and commissions have been fulfilled. Said license is subject to all conditions stated upon it. Failure to comply with any and all conditions shall invalidate the license and all avoid with the conditions of the DCG to be placed on the license. Second. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? It is unanimous, Sharon. Thanks so much for coming in and good luck. Thank you very much. Okay. The next item we have is gift acceptance in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53A. The first item is a gift of a bench for the library. Um, and the gift is from Ms. Liza Lucas. Um, and Ms. Liza here, good evening. If you, I could read the letter, but I'll let you um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about your proposed gift. Well, what we'd like to do, oh, should I say my name, Liza Lucas? <laughs> Thank you. Um, what we'd like to do, is my, tw this is our 25 year anniversary of my mother's passing this coming year. Um, she was a lifelong resident of Auburn. I've grown up in Auburn. I've since moved to Rutland, but still am a great love of Auburn. Um, we would definitely like to give back to the town something that would be a memory for her in the town that she lived in. Great, thank you. Do any members have any questions? Okay. And, um, Ms. Jacobson, the procedure for this? I mean, I know we're accepting it, uh, but... Through the chair. Yes, uh, the board would have to accept this as a donation. We have already uh, spoken to the board of trustees at the library, uh, and they were certainly interested, and we will work with DPW um, and Ms. Lucas to cite this at, at the library. Can I ask a question? Is there a size requirement or a particular material requirement that yeah. we need to follow? Um, through the chair, we would recommend that you meet with our DPW director because okay. we do have other benches yeah. that uh, they're either no or low maintenance type materials so it's it's a good question okay. but yes there are certain materials that we want it to be made of so that it cuts down on any maintenance from the DPW. And then is there a time frame? I mean we, we'd love to have it done before her anniversary date of March 28th. Um, we do have a family gathering on April 9th. Uh, I would have to defer to the DPW director, weather will play a part in this yes. um, as far as the installation right. goes and yeah. depending on where it is and how much more of this lovely okay. uh, white stuff we got. Oh yes. Uh, that, <laughs> that may or may not be an issue. Okay. Um, all right. We're happy to work with you. If Great. you want to call our office, my office tomorrow morning, we're happy sure. to put you in touch with the DPW director and we'll get it all straightened away. Sounds we're good. Great. Thank you. for your donation. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for coming in and thank you for such a thoughtful gift to the town. Thank you. Is there a motion? Make a motion that we accept this gift with gratitude. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Thank you again for coming in. And uh, the town manager's office will follow up with you. 
Um, the next item we have is the March 28th, 2017 Special Town Meeting Warrant. And we would need to vote to approve subject to the final review by Town Council. Do any members have any questions regarding this? One question. Mr. Carpenter. Um, on Article 3, can, since it, the CFO is here, can you explain the article? Mr. Casanova? Sure. Uh, through the Chair, Mr. Carpenter. <clears throat> this is typically done um, annually. We repurpose uh, monies that we have already borrowed. In the cases that have been identified, these line items, these projects have either been completed uh, with residual balances or the item. Uh, specifically, I want to uh, um, identify the police fencing is no longer a priority of the police department. Uh, so we're asking that these monies be repurposed for the purpose uh, as identified on the second page, which is for highway smoke and uh, carbon dioxide. Um, Monoxide alarm detectors and for fire turnout gear. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the warrant subject to final review by Town Council. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chim. I mean, Mr. Carpenter, is there a second? Second. Ms. Brotherton, are there, is there any comment? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? It's unanimous, Sharon. Thank you. The next item is a vote on the spe special municipal employees designation. And I'll turn to Mrs. Jacobson for a summary on this. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Uh, it has uh, been brought to our attention that there are certain positions in the town, and again, it's the position, not the individual, that should be designated under Mass General Law Chapter 268A by the Board of Selectmen as something called a Special Municipal Employee. And as you can see from your package, there were several various votes that were taken by prior Board of Selectmen uh, to designate, again, it's the position, it's the members within a committee, it's not the actual individual who holds that seat as a Special Municipal Employee. The most recent one that was done in, in all of your term, in mine here, uh, was the one that we did in September for environmental consultants. The basic gist of this is, if we have anyone that we hire for part-time work or um, volunteer for the town and have other jobs, whether they're part-time or full-time, for us to appoint them or for them to sometimes be hired, they have to go through the State Ethics Commission and get make sure that there are no conflicts of interest. The State Ethics Commission generally recommends that the board or commission for which they're seeking a seat be appointed as a special municipal employee so that it removes or eliminates any potential conflict of interest. And I'll give you an example. Um, if we have an attorney or an architect that wants to be a member of the ZBA or of the planning board, and that person were to uh, have clients that may come before another board in town or that board, obviously they'd have to remove themselves from that board if they were representing a client. They could not do that. Um, but to go before another board, they would just have to make sure that the board that, they're, that they are a member of is a special town employee, which gives them the ability to participate in other matters. Um, as you can see from the list that was done, the first list that was done starting back in 1977 and going up through uh, 2016, prior select boards did appoint, uh, designate special town employees for many of the town uh, boards and commissions. Since the last time this was done in 2005, there are some newer boards and commissions, and there were some that actually should be included in this as well. Uh, in going through the list, we went through all of the current boards and commissions just to make sure they're all included in this. Uh, the, we also are adding in uh, part-time clerks. We don't have any currently, but should we? For instance, if we were to hire someone at, say, eight hours a week to take minutes at one of the regulatory board commissions, that person would have to, um, would likely have to contact the Ethics Commission. The Ethics Commission would suggest that in order to get paid from another position and paid for that, they'd be designated as a special town employee. So that's why in the first part, 
of these, you'll see uh, boards and committees that should be uh, um, designated. And on the second portion, you will see uh, the part-time municipal positions that should be designated. Uh, in speaking with town council, he has confirmed that as long as the positions that are listed here, which they all are, meet one of the following criteria on the second paragraph on the first page, which is uh, under Chapter 268A, uh, that these positions should be designated. And just for the record, those under the state law, a position is eligible to, to be designated as a special municipal employee, provided that one, the person in the position is not paid, or the position is a part-time position, allowing an individual to work at another job during working hours. Uh, or three, the individual in the position is not paid by the town for more than 800 working hours or approximately 20 weeks full-time during the preceding 365 days. So this really covers, you know, if you look at the list, um, we hire part-time people at the golf course. We hire people to um, part-time employees to be down at the leaf pile. Uh, we hire people in the recreation program for, you know, a 10-week period. So any of those positions that fall into these these designations, we're seeking uh, approval for the board to appoint it as a special municipal employee. Thank you. Are there any questions? Is there a motion to designate the positions outlined in the town manager's letter designated 6D as special municipal employees? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Is there a discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? It's unanimous, Sharon. Thank you very much. You're welcome. The next item we have is a request to change owner information on flammable storage permit at 17 St. Mark Street here in Auburn. Enclosed is a letter from the town clerk, Deb Grimo, requesting the board vote to change the owner information for 17 St. Mark Street from Consolidated Fabricators to GP East LLC, 129 North 10th Street, Capitol Hall, Lincoln, Nebraska. Are there any questions? Is there a motion? Is there a motion to approve the change of ownership information? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Request for proclamation, there are none. We have a, an application for a drain layers license for Anchor Excavating Corporation of Hanover, Mass. Enclosed are the application documents and recommendation of the Sewer Commissioner, Commission and Superintendent. The um, application is complete. The Sewer Superintendent has signed off on this. The license fee has been provided. We have been provided with the um, requested references. Is there any discussion on this? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the license? Would you like to make a motion that we approve the license, provided that all the applicable requirements of the state and town and any of its departments, boards, and commissions have been fulfilled? Said license is subject to all the conditions stated upon. Failure to comply with any and all the conditions shall invalidate the license and render it null and void. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? It's unanimous, Sharon. Thank you. The next item we have is the fiscal year 2018 budget. We have our budget books. Um, this is informational tonight. We won't be taking a vote tonight to transmit the budget, but uh, Mr. Kasanovich is going to do a brief presentation and answer questions if the members have any questions tonight. Sure, at this time, Madam Chair, I'd like to just pass along some of the highlights we identified Certainly. as Thank part you. of the submittal. Great. I'll just take one. <laughs> so the, the uh, budget was, uh, made uh, available to the board members on Friday of February 10th. Uh, in terms of process, we are not seeking a vote tonight. We would ask that the board review the budgets over the course of the next two weeks. And we will come back on um, at your next meeting on February 27th, seeking a vote for you to transmit it to the Finance Committee. And they would commence their um, their budget review starting on March 1st. So that's, we're gearing up for that timeline. In terms of the budget, FY18 budget, uh, 
um, that has been recommended. Uh, the budget is proposing an appropriation increase of approximately $1.8 million. That's a 2.91% increase over current fiscal year. We've identified revenues uh, projected at a 3.90% increase over current fiscal year, or growth of 2.416 million. Um, we've realized through state aid, through the governor's numbers, an increase in our cherry sheet revenue of $1.142 million. That's a 10.27% increase. And I'll get into some of the specifics of that in a little bit. Uh, we're utilizing a tax levy of $1.5 million, or a 4.04% increase. Um, and everything else is basically level funded. Uh, certainly the estimated receipts, local receipts, is too early to determine. But based upon an actual um, revenue analysis from December 31st of last year to December 31st of this fiscal year, we're basically running about even. We're down a little bit, but that could be cyclical due to the timing of commitments and things of that nature. So we're on course. Uh, to meet our, our revenue projections on the local receipt side for the current fiscal year through the first six months. In terms of tax levy, this budget proposes a utilization of about just under 1% out of a possible 2.5%. Um, the budget that's before you in your binders would reflect a uh, $645,000 on obligated balance. Uh, we're not proposing to use any of that at this time. Um, given the fact that we only have one set of numbers and that's the governor's numbers, albeit those numbers look very good for the town of Auburn, uh, but there are still two sets of numbers that we have to work our way through before we can make a final recommendation leading into the annual town meeting. On the second page, on the cherry sheet numbers, we've recognized an increase using the governor's numbers of a million forty-two thousand for Chapter Seventy alone, an unrestricted local aid increase of about four percent, or sixty-four thousand two hundred nineteen dollars. On the appropriation side, this budget proposes sixteen new positions. They're broken down as follows. The Department of Inspectional Services has the equivalent of one full-time. We're increasing two part-time positions to make them full-time. Uh, the police has asked for three positions. Uh, we've built in two in their budget. One with a start date of 7117. The second one with a start date of 1118. On a budgetary basis, it's the equivalent of 1.5. Uh, but on an annual basis, it's, it's a full two positions. Uh, fire, uh, we're making a recommendation for four new positions to meet their schedule change from 48 to 42 hours. We were able to do make this commitment as a result of the firefighters uh, accepting a zero, zero, zero COLA increase over the, their current contract, which began on, on July 1 of 16 and expires June 30th of 19. That's a three year period. DPW, we are recommending one new heavy equipment operator in the highway department. In schools, in their budget has asked for six positions. A math STEM teacher, three ABAs, one pre-K instructional assistant, and one pre-K teacher. On the employee benefit side, this, this budget recommends an increase in uh, employee and in, in group health insurance of 510000 That's an 8% increase. Um, the Worcester Regional Retirement Assessment, which we have obtained, has an increase of 287000 or a 12.25% increase. We have COLAs built in on averaging about 2% town-wide for all negotiated contracts. Um, our overall debt and interest, uh, we're 
anticipating or projecting a reduction of approximately 319,000 over current fiscal year. That's a reduction of about 4.9%, almost 5% reduction. That's for both debt and interest. Uh, we've increased that snow and ice budget but in the amount of 81,000. Quite honestly, I, I would like to see if we could increase it by more than that. Our three-year average is running at about 375. Our current year budget is slightly over 300,000. Um, I can tell you we're operating in a deficit as we speak. Uh, we hope to address that through some accumulated appropriation surpluses that we may recognize during the year, as well as a reliance on our, our reserve account to, to help us mitigate that. Speaking of our reserve fund, we're trying to build that up as well in accordance with the financial policies to address this issue, issues such as snow and ice. That's up 25,000, an increase of about 17%. Our Bay Path assessment currently stands at an increase of 18,531. That may change. That is assessed based upon the governor's numbers as well. Uh, that's an increase of 1.68%. Uh, for the first time, we built in a assessment that we have to pay over the long term to Norfolk Agric Agricultural uh, School. It's a vocational school. Uh, that we have to provide the education for one student uh, in Auburn. That our Bay Path uh, Vocational School program does not offer this program. Um, this budget applies once again one tenth of two and a half towards our capital improvement program. That amount is approximately $103,609 for the coming fiscal year. Um, we also have a total cumulative tax levy funding in place of about $860,000 to apply towards our annual capital program as a result of our adherence to our financial policies, which I believe is EF5, applying $100,000 of tax levy towards our capital needs, uh, thus resulting in less dependency on bond proceeds to fund our capital program. This budget maintains an annual appropriation of $500,000 towards our OPEB uh, liability and obligation. The current balance for the current fiscal year in that account is uh, almost $2.8 million. And it sets aside, um, and it does not set aside at this point in time any money towards our stabilization account. We normally make a recommendation at the fall town meeting. Additionally, I can tell you that our amended policy for free cash is going to allow us some additional flexibility to earmark money towards, uh, towards funding our stabilization account as well as OPEB in the future. So that's a summary of uh, the key points and highlights of the budget that you have received. Uh, we welcome any questions over the course of the next couple of weeks that you may have uh, as part of your review. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have at this point in time um, relative to this presentation or the budget that you have received. I, I you know, acknowledge that members have just received their budget books. Are there any questions this evening? So I would encourage members to reach out to the CFO if they have any questions. Um, as it is, a, you know, we anticipated that we will take a vote at the next meeting to transfer the budget to the Finance Committee. Okay. Anything else, Ms. Kasnovich? No. Thanks so much for the summary. You're welcome. Um, the next item is a vote um, to revoke the flammable storage permits at 68 Central Street, 200 Auburn Street, and 4-10 St. Mark Street due to the removal of the tanks. We do have a letter from the town clerk, Deb Grimo, um, stating that per... Um, Per information obtained from Captain Steven Anderson of the Auburn Fire Department, the tanks have been removed and should not be assessed a registration fee any longer. Are there any questions on this? Is there a motion? I'd like to make a motion that we revoke the flammable storage permits at 68 Central Street, 200 Auburn Street, and 4-10 St. Mark Street due to the removal of the tanks. 
Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? It is unanimous, Sharon. Thank you. Uh, next we have town manager item, so I'll turn it over to the town manager for the first item, which is the Auburn Police Department 12th Citizens Police Academy. Uh, yes, thank you. In your packet this evening, I just wanted to uh, place a announcement about the 12th Citizens Police Academy. Uh, as, as you know, you've gone through the academy. They do a tremendous job. It's just such an amazing opportunity. The fire department runs one as well. Um, but a great opportunity for residents to learn about the operations of the police department. The classes will begin on March 1st and run uh, through on Wednesday evenings from 6 to 9 from March 1 to April 26th. The applications are actually due this week, so if you are interested, please contact Sergeant Dan Lamoureux at the Auburn uh, Police Department at 508-832-7777. Uh, applications can be picked up actually at the police station or they can be downloaded on their website at auburnmasspolice.org. Um, and again, the, the applications are due, I believe, this week, so we wanted to make sure that uh, you and the public were aware of this, this yeah. great program. Great. You know, and as the town manager pointed out, I did have the opportunity to graduate from the Citizens Police Academy, and it really is um, a wonderful opportunity, not just for board members, but for residents to really learn about the inner workings of the police department. We think, you know, we understand the basics of it, but when you really understand um, the, the complete operation of the um, police department, it really is an eye-opener. And the officers who are involved in the Citizens Police Academy do it with such enthusiasm and um, really appreciation for the residents who take their time to attend the police academy. I really encourage members of this board and residents to participate in the Citizens Police Academy. Um, did you have anything else for member of uh, the town manager items tonight? Um, I was going to make a mention, but I think you were too, so if you want to. Sure. We, obviously, we. Um, we, we didn't want tonight's meeting to um, close before we acknowledged the tragedy that we had this week in Auburn um, with our um, officer who was severely injured. Um, we have a police department second to none. They've already dealt with uh, the, the worst tragedy that any police department could deal with earlier this year and the stress and the the stress that they have to deal with right now dealing with this. I, I'm going to turn it over to the town manager to speak on a personal level about um, Officer Santos and um, what he's going through and what we can do as a community. Thank you. Um, again, to reiterate what the vice chair said, all of us on uh, in town administration, and I'm sure we've been getting calls from residents as well, but our thoughts and prayers are with Officer Santos and his family, his wife and four young children, as well as with all the members of our police and fire rescue department. Fire rescue department obviously being on first responders and, you know, being there again uh, when a tragic, tragic uh, situation occurs like that. We're just grateful that Officer Santos survived this really brutal assault, uh, an intentional assault. And we thank him for his many years of dedicated service to the town of Auburn. For those of you who, who um, have had the opportunity to work with him or meet him, always got a smile on his face, very professional, very friendly, uh, warm, just to, you know, he's a great representative of the Auburn Police Department. Um, we're praying for a quick and successful re recovery for him. Uh, it would be a huge loss to the department to not have him come back. So even in his absence while he's uh, getting through his injuries, it's difficult for them, as you said. And they're all, they've, we've all been through a very difficult time, the department in particular, since Officer Tarantino was killed in May. And this is just another example of how dangerous the work is of our police officers and our fire rescue. And, and the fact that every single day they're putting their lives on the line for our community. And uh, these incidents, when they happen, it just brings it home how dangerous these jobs really are. And 
most of us know that, um, and we thank them for it, and just want to make sure that he and his family know that they are in our thoughts, as, as well as with, and with the community. We've already received calls and requests for information on how to help. At this point, I would direct all the calls and offers to the police department, um, and the police association will likely be working to uh, make some of these um, offers come to fruition and fulfill some of the requests for fundraisers and things like that. So please contact the uh, Auburn Police Department. And again, we want to just reach out to Officer Santos and his family, thank him for his service, wish him a, a hopefully a, a good recovery, and, um, and thank his family for the sacrifice that they make by allowing him to be a part of our, our town family. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add, you know, the, the comments that our, our community have made on social media have been so positive and so supportive and so kind. And, you know, in a day where social media may um, may get tough and rough, um, I, I thank everyone who has commented so positively and kindly and compassionately to the Auburn police and uh, obviously Officer Santos and his family. So we will continue to keep all of them in our thoughts and prayers and we'll update the community when we have information available. So thank you for that. Thank you. I should make a mention also Officer McLean. Um, yes. You know, all of our officers, we're, we're lucky. We just have a tremendous department. They're all professional. They're all highly skilled and, and talented. And they give much more uh, back to the community than most people ever realize. But uh, Officer McLean, it's worth absolutely worth noting that he uh, actually did uh -huh, get the suspect into custody that, that afternoon. So we're grateful to him as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, we have no tabled items. Are there any Board of Selectmen member items? None that we had submitted. We do have, um, is there any additional public comment? You just see a, listening to us to the end, huh? <laughs> we do have minutes from November 14th, 2016 and November 28th, 2016. Um, are there any corrections or omissions on these minutes? If not, I will accept them as written. If there's no further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you so much.